Hello everyone and welcome to our conversation about uh, bespoke shoemaking. I'd like to say a big thank you to the company of Cordwainers for supporting this and also to Curry Ducker for hosting us. Today we're going to have a, a talk with a deliberately provocative title of What's the Point of Bespoke? which I think is hopefully going to bring in some really interesting views about the different aspects of bespoke shoemaking and about where it is today, where it's going in the future. We have also deliberately gathered to hear a group of different shoemakers, different backgrounds and very different styles to create some kind of diverse in the conversation, which I think will be really interesting. So I'm going to just leave everyone to introduce themselves and go around the table one by one. Hello, my name is Dominic Casey. I'm a bespoke shoemaker based in London. I run a last making business called Last Maker House in Eastbourne, and I'm a livery member of the Cordwainers Company. Hi there, I'm Felix Rano. I make bespoke American workwear style boots in East London. Hello, my name is James Ducker. I'm co-founder and director of Kari Ducker. We're bespoke shoemakers based in London and we also run a shoemaking and leatherwork school which is where we are now. Hi, my name is Sebastian Tarek. I'm a bespoke shoemaker based in Arnold Circus area of East London where I work as a freelance outworker for some of the West End firms as well as a fairly small business that I run under my own name. Hi, my name is James Kearns. I make bespoke trainers and work boots for the avant-garde genre and I'm based in East London. Super, thank you very much everybody. Great. Right, well let's see as we started with a, here's a very provocative title, let's talk about uh, the trade. Is the trade of bespoke shoemaking dying, James? What's your view? Well, I mean if you look around the table, the variety of makers here would say, would suggest that it isn't. And I think if you look around the country, there are bespoke makers of all sorts of constructions and ways of doing it and I think it's certainly not dying. Uh, you might say that West End shoemaking is, is niche because of the price point but there's plenty of other uh, people making shoes of all different sorts all around the country. Do you, do you think in, in the, say, the time you've been making shoes for example has that grown? There's a much much more variety of shoemakers and bespoke now than used to be? Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm certainly more aware of them. It might be just my kind of evolution as a shoemaker and, and knowledge but I think it's much easier to get knowledge these days with the, with the internet and communications are much easier so I think mm. it's easier to find out what's going on uh, around the world even. Do you see kind of lots of different types of shoemakers in the area that you're in and is that kind of easier to kind of uh, learn about things to see other people because yeah. of the internet? I mean there's quite a lot, like there's now the beauty of Instagram where everyone can upload their own images and it's really easy to use and so you can find out quite a lot uh, about what's going on in the world and there's various other shoemakers that kind of want to take their own path and really kind of find their own niche and what they like doing mm. um, so they don't really feel the need to have to be like right I'm going to be a bespoke shoemaker I'm going to make classic West End shoes they can still apply the same techniques and get a really nicely made shoe but in a different style. Because they're kind of encouraged style. by seeing all these other things yeah, around the no, world definitely. and see other people doing things. There's lots of I mean, if yeah. I, I'd have to say that I think that if you can choose to, to go down a path of learning how to make shoes, traditionally you only had a fairly focused pathway that you could mm. take as you were describing. Say for instance, getting an apprenticeship with mobs and becoming sort of a very classical yeah. West End shoemaker. If you can get to a certain point and then decide that you're going to diverge quite dramatically as you have, mm. there must be a, a fairly large audience for consumption of bespoke shoes. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the kind of point of, you know, is bespoke shoemaking a, a diminishing trade, clearly there's a big audience. Mm -hmm. It might not be as big as maybe it was, say, 30, 40 years ago, yeah. but it's clearly a resurgent audience, I'd have to yeah, say. Yeah, it's not that it's not as big, it's just changing. Mm. The variety of shoemakers, if you look around this table, you know, from... James, Bastian, Felix, there's a huge range of types of shoes being made. So bespoke is uh, thriving and growing as always, and people are just choosing to have different types of things made for them. Yeah. Rather, than yeah, yeah, yeah. Out, rather than the classic type of shoe. So shoemaking. we're all taking classical met you know, methodology to, to produce the finished article, but it's coming from different backgrounds. I mean, for myself, I wasn't classically trained, so I had no classical skills of kind of, this is how you're supposed to make a, a Pair of shoes. So how so, did you learn shoemaking? Then? Well, I learned myself through YouTube videos. Oh, really? So, um, okay. understanding that there's sort of three or four different ways to make a pair of shoes and then finding what ways work for the product that I wanted to produce mm -hmm. and taking it to another step further. So, it's not only diversifying as a, as a product and what's on the market now, it's also the leather that's being used for it. So, traditionally, you get the leather from the tanner or you get it from a supplier. 
you know, in that finished color effectively, and you simply make the product and present it to the client. Whereas now, certainly on my side, I'm doing a lot more treatments in house. Some are, you know, purchasing mm. natural tan, virgin tan, natural tan leathers, and now I'm doing the, the processing myself, offering, you know, a limitless sort of supply of colors and finishes to that leather. And I, I think from both James and my perspective, as people who actually teach shoe making as well, we either teach last making or shoe making, the number of young people actually coming into the industry. Mm. It's terribly exciting. It's expanding. You know, we have people come from all over the world to come and study last making down in Eastbourne. Mm. And it's really interesting what James says is that people have taught themselves from YouTube. They turn up with a completely different perspective yeah. on how to make shoes. That's really exciting. Yeah. You know, they actually have, uh, uh, you know, various techniques and they're looking at leather in a different way. So the whole thing is very rich, bubbling away underneath the surface. Mm. And do you, do you think that those young people coming to learn, do they fully appreciate the amount of time and things that kind of involved in getting to a certain level to be able to do it very well. I think it's a challenge. Once they spent a week with me, yeah. Exactly, once they spent a week with me, yeah, we try and persuade them not to resign early. You know, don't give up. You know, well, it's I, think, a, I think there's lots of people who, who start by themselves and they watch YouTube and blogs and various things, mm. but there's a bit of a gap between that Mm. And then establishing, establishing yourself as a professional like you've done. Sure. And mm. that, that requires a certain personality and a certain perseverance and a certain kind of mm. mindset. Because yeah. you have to be really, really single-minded about it. Because you have mm. to put loads of hours in. You have to do a lot of work. Mm. And it's not that easy. Yeah. Mm. I think people need to give themselves at least five years to yeah. get to a point where they're happy to, you know, produce a product to a finished level that they're willing to sort of mm. sell at a price that warrants the amount of hours they put into mm. it. And is that how long you really need before you can even diverge into a different kind of style and do something different? Because that's the basics of the last making and doing stitching to a certain moment. Right? I mean, I always maintain that I would never refer to myself as a shoemaker until I had 10 years under my belt. Yeah. Mm. And actually, upon reaching that point and passing it, I realised I was probably short by about 20. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly, yeah. It really is. <laughs> actually, yeah. How long is a piece of string? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're I, all lifetime learners, aren't yeah, we? Exactly. You know, we're all yeah. just beginning. Yeah. Which is you one know. of the most beautiful things about yeah. shoemaking is that there is an inherent humility in the craft. Mm. And I think particularly in something like bespoke shoe making where perhaps in manufacturing shoes which you wholesale to someone else and there's a third party which sells them for you, you never have to confront the reality of the shortcomings of your... from it, yeah. Completely. And I think if you can't prostrate yourself in front of a client and say, I'm sorry that you seem to be experiencing some discomfort, sir, <laughs> and explain how that you will resolve this issue, then I think you're going to have a very short career. And it, it feels like, um, I know we were kind of talking about this briefly earlier, that that's one of the reasons that Bespoke is so strong is because there's so many different ways you might get into it and might like it. One of them would like a fine, you know, just normal Oxford uh, West End dress shoe. It might be just the fit and the kind of refinements of it. But actually, another someone else might not care at all about the fit and it might be just about the customization and the creative mm -hmm. process, right? So they're coming mm -hmm. to you for a completely different reason. And it feels like mm -hmm. with, with everyone here, people are often coming to you for that particular look. So it's more, it's... Customization, but it's also kind of I buy into your look and I want to just customize it as I well. I mean, I think uh, you have quite a finite breadth of upper styles that you can do. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. how you differentiate, you know, like I want a pair of Oxfords, sure. How do you make a black pair of Oxfords look different between, say, how all of us might potentially make them? Mm -hmm. Predominantly, it will be sort of the materials that you use in order to do yeah. it. But I think that's the uniqueness. And the, uh, what's really interesting about Bespoke is the uniqueness and the individuality of it. Mm. You look around the table here and you've got individual makers making very different. They're all making Bespoke. They're all making stuff that's handmade. And yeah. they're all working individually on their own. But they're making in individual products for a client who is essentially a unique individual individual as well. So yeah. it's very much tailored specifically towards what the client wants. Each customer that you get has an input into what, mm. what the final shoe looks like. Yeah. So mm. you, you know you have to be really sensitive to what they're saying and then there's lots of interpretation. It's a kind of two-way process and that's part of the experience yeah. of getting their shoes is mm. that they create it with you. Mm. And so every time it's going to look different. Yeah, because mm. the interaction there is kind of part of the joy as well. Mm. Felix, and you said you switched from doing sort of slightly dressy shoes to kind of the boot 
mm. side, was that driven just by yourself, or was it also kind of interaction with seeing clients or friends and saying, actually, I want um, that kind of So I kind of started making, like, uh, working for a company called TNF Slack Shoemakers, making colourful brogues and things like that, which obviously wasn't very me. Mm. And then, because I've always been into riding motorcycles and things like that, I always started making shoes for myself and what I kind of liked. So it kind mm. of, like, was driven by what I kind of admired in shoes and then the whole like 1940s, 50s kind of western style boots played like a really big influence into the stuff that I make right now. Did any of you have that same kind of experience of other friends just sort of seeing what you had or what you're making and then it just kind of growing slowly like that? I mean, I think uh, in a city which has a fair amount of saturation of option, ultimately how do you dif differentiate yourself from you know, other firms, your peers, things like that. And I think, I mean, I, ultimately, I, I always want to try and make a pair of shoes that I would wear. The, the personal becomes very, very important as you start to go beyond just replicating other people's wishes completely. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting kind of variation, isn't it? Because I think, again, around the table, there's variation there that I think someone like James, for example, is more likely to, you're still going to turn some customers away and want something you're just never going to make, but you're more likely to make things that are... Uh, a more greater range of shoes for different types of customer. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone like James, people are going to him for a, a very particular look, mm -hmm. and actually it's mostly about just colours and little design points, right? Yes. And okay. somebody kind of more in between. So, like mm -hmm. Sebastian, you know, you're have a particular look, but maybe still going to vary it a little bit if that's what the kind of sure. customer wants. So it feels like that's another strength of bespoke. Some people can be mm -hmm. entirely design led by you, or actually much less design, have their own views, and mm -hmm. yet you can kind of fill all those kind of gaps yeah, at as the well. end I think what's quite important is um, you own your own company essentially you're putting out your name so you yeah. have to make something that you're proud of yeah and you're like right I've spent two weeks flat out just doing this shoe this is my pride and joy here you go <laughs> yeah. and if you're not yeah. proud of that then yeah. what's the point is that one to one with the company? product and then with the customer yeah. once you develop that relationship with the client they've even made that investment. They yeah. might not necessarily be someone who is particularly predisposed to going shopping, yeah. but they need a pair of shoes, and so they come to see you because they see that you can fulfill that brief for them. Once mm. they've made that establishment, you're now obliged, like a, a marriage, through the duration of their sartorial <laughs> lives, yeah. to outfit them for everything yeah. that they want. Plus, yeah. you know their foot better than anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So why would you get anybody else yeah. to make a pair of shoes for Yeah, But somebody so, did ask me for a pair of engineer's boots, and I did refer them to <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, Do you know what? That's not what you need to go and talk to that guy. But, yeah. I mean, just, we're getting customers coming to us wanting various things, and, and we don't always have to make a hand-welted leather sole shoe. You can hand last something and then cement it and get it sent off and have it machine like stitch sole. Mm, yeah. You know, if they want, if they don't want to spend three thousand pounds upwards mm. on a leather sole shoe, they want something else. But they're not. They, so you have to give them that variety and that kind of chance. And there is to quite a lot of choice and variety, and obviously mm. the very labour intensive. Get the price and the cheap. I mean, it doesn't necessarily make the shoe gonna fall apart after you know, yeah. a few years. Still gonna have a lot of integrity and made well. You know, you'll. You know, all of us are going to be, say, releasing this product, so we, we know it's going to last. We're putting our integrity mm. into so belief of that. I think that's actually maybe one of the kind of like clearer divisions between how you and I work. I would only do that kind of thing that you're describing after I've done a full hand sewn, welted leather sole yeah. shoe. Well, that's what. So, we, yeah, we do that. We 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 initially have to make the last and get the shoe, the well, first shoe done, and then afterwards. Like would no, you not on the version? first one, right, probably not. So we go through the whole yeah. process, fitting process, yeah. and get the last right. And from there, yeah, they can yeah. have pretty much what they want. Sure, sure, I sure. mean, we've recently done a kind of unstructured, uh, unlined leather, essentially a slip, and you know, a, a much lower price. And, and our bespoke customers love them. You know, people are ordering two, two and three pairs, mm -hmm. and so they can have them in their various houses around the, around the place. And, and actually, and and just kick, yeah, 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 it's I've great. Really and I really like doing it because it's yeah. different. You know, you, you, you have different challenges mm -hmm. when you're making it, and, and they're happy, which is kind of what you want. And when, you, when you're learning mm -hmm. to, when you do something different like that, how you, there must be some technical challenge within there you've got to learn to do for the first time. Are you 
asking people about that, or you don't academic <laughs> people? <laughs> Dominic, <laughs> I've got a question. Can exactly. you can you talk? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's invariably you try and find someone that you've worked with previously who yeah. you trust their opinion, and even if they don't know the answer specifically, you want them either to lie to you convincingly, yeah. or tell you for lack of confidence. Yeah, you'll be fine, Felix. Don't worry. I'm sure it'll fit. So one thing that has changed since I since I started is that people are willing to share information. Yeah. Like really? When I started off, people yeah. would hide their techniques. And I mean, Tony Slinger in Yorkshire, he said when he was training, they would yeah. turn their backs mm -hmm. if they were doing something that they developed and they would not share it. But <laughs> my, our, our philosophy right from the word go was like, share it, get the information out of there, our blog. We, we gave it away and people said, well, why are you doing that? And we said, because we want to encourage yeah. People, people to get on and do it and yeah. help people and, yeah. and it's quite a collegiate kind of atmosphere now and you yeah. can just phone people and say you know have you ever done this how does this work you know help me yeah. out and people do i find it's really i find it's it's oddly a very cultural thing like different places have different very different attitudes to it you know, i moved back here in 2003 i had a letter of introduction to lobs and i met one of the lob family who very generously gave me his time and i said you know my intention is to come here for a year perhaps a two year depending on what my income will allow um and i'd like to sort of you know learn as much as i can from him and then i'm going to go back to australia and he just looked at me sort of gobsmacked like why would I do that? I remember at the time thinking, <laughs> this man's grasp of economics is clearly very good. Cool. I have some skills. I'm willing to give you for free. Yeah. But I had no appreciation of just how much was involved in the process of okay. learning how to make mm. shoes properly. And perhaps that work. But he, he knows the back of the head is going to be five years, yeah. this guy. Yeah. Well, it's going to be two years before he's really going to be able to contribute anything yeah, exactly. to what he's going to do. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, point. Yeah. And why, why do you think that's changed in, the time, in that the last 10, 20 years? That people are much more collaborative and willing to share. Is that, a, is that partly to do with social media, the fact that everyone's just yeah. seeing what everyone else is doing anyway? Or you know? Information leaks out. It's going to so be out no less. Point. Yeah. So yeah. why hide it? Yeah. And where's the next generation going to come from unless people like yeah. us help them? Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I think maybe 20 years ago the industry was contracting. So mm -hmm. there, there has been a contraction of sorts. And I think it is people sort of like Harry Ducker and, and the democratisation that the internet has provided, which almost be, become responsible for ensuring that these crafts can't shrink. So you started that, with that question about kind of whether bespoke shoe making was dying, which yeah, clearly it's not, but anyway, it's a good question. The, I like those kind of, there's different benefits of bespoke that you're, that might bring people in and kind of help support them. We talked about the fit, um, we talked about kind of like um, the customer customization. Another one is definitely that kind of relationship we talked about with a customer. Um, and being their kind of shoemaker for a long period of time. Do you think that's still as strong as it used to be, but because people have almost so much choice that they're less likely to have that long-term relationship? Mm -hmm. Particularly initially, my client base, as I developed, worked in creative fields. So quite a lot of photographers, chefs, people like that, and they're not necessarily people who are naturally inclined to leather sole shoes. Sure. So you might get someone who might have one pair, then maybe in a pinch would have a second pair, mm -hmm. but yeah. they've also got you know two pairs of trainers, a pair of hiking boots. I uh, was it like mm. in sneakers, James? I do have quite a lot of returning customers, but mm. quite often it's either because they want it to wear for a specific event, like say Burning Man, or okay. to wear with a certain sort of set of their wardrobe. So it's kind of quite specific okay. for, not necessarily occasion, but for certain looks. People shoes. at the moment, um, they're really kind of starting to admire craft and really enjoy watching it. And I think people, may not be able to afford a pair of bespoke shoes, but want a bespoke shoe. Okay. So they'll save up a lot of money and be like, right, I don't want to own 50 pairs of trainers that I just want one really nice, well-made shoe that's going to last me. And it doesn't have to be stylish or fashionable. It just has to go with my outfits that yeah. I wear most days and just blends seamlessly into that. Guys yeah. ride bikes or yeah. whatever, then actually there's, there's less variation because that's kind of what they're doing, yeah. right? You can just kind of wear this, almost the same shoe every single day. Yeah, it, it's not sort of my style, so I don't really know it very well, but I kind of feel like if you're on the kind of dressier, kind of West End spectrum, there's more of a sense that you might want lots of different shoes and lots of different tailoring and you're like mixing it up and mm. kind of be expressive, whereas actually more on the kind of workwear end, mm. it's more about good clothes that last yeah. well and really practical and wear, so yeah. actually having just one or two pairs of boots yeah. is kind of, you know, is the, the point, because you have like that one leather jacket and everything else. Yeah. Right? And you want, you want to see the wear. 
Yeah, yeah. And this is sort of maybe one of those kind of particular sort of divergences yeah. that, you know, for Felix's clients, they want their boots to look very worn in, yeah. almost yeah. from the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whereas obviously you'd like your shoes to look fairly smart yeah, yeah, yeah. and kind of well, well, well kept. One, one guy actually came in and said that he, uh, he wears all his shoes, like I think it was five times, or wears them for like a month and then gives them to his valet. I'm like, no, no, that's completely the wrong way around. No. Like, traditionally, yeah. like, like an English aristocrat would give them to his valet to wear in, and yeah. they give them to him when they're actually wearable. And like, they do it completely the wrong way and around. I, I find that really, because I still work for some of the West End firms, and sometimes when you get a pair of shoes, it's quite clear, it's like, well, so, I have one pair of lasts here, I have five pairs of uppers, and they're all exactly the same. Why am I making this gentleman five pairs of shoes? And then the workshop manager will politely tell you that well, well, there's one pair for his house in the Bahamas, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's one for his house here. It's like... So you can travel yeah. light. Yeah. Travel light. Because <laughs> that is the ultimate like luxury. The rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Another kind of customer we often get is what I call bespoke junkies, who you, you, yeah. you start making and you have the conversation, and then they slip into the conversation, oh yes, well I... I've had my lob shoes and I've been to Clevin, I've been here and, and they basically just try everyone yeah. and I think they just love it. But yeah, it's not the final shoes that's, that motivates yeah. them, it's the doing it. You know, okay. I, probably my best client, he's a stylist, when I first met him he was in the process of having a pair of shoes that he bought that he was having renovated, Fosses were making him a pair, Clevs were making him a pair mm. and then I was and it was like, he'd actually been a big Carol Christian Powell fan and had sold all of his to start investing in his new him, essentially. Oh, yeah. So he put it into bespoke footwear. And he still like occasionally buys some, some old stuff, might have it done up, but then he'll put it on an eBay and he'll make back enough for the deposit for his next pair of bespoke oh, shoes. Trade it in and get a, get exactly. a new model. <laughs> <laughs> Is fit less of a drive with like a, like a working boot, for example? No, Is it I more think... variation or, or not? Mm. Like you probably could get away with less less of a strict fit, but I still make it my focal point. So at okay. each of my customers, I take all their measurements, do them a fitting shoe, and make them last. Um, because most work boots, they're built quite tough, really thick leathers and things like that. So they're a lot harder to break in. Okay. Yeah. Whereas if you uh, have a bespoke fit, you're taking away like a month of pain into yeah, yeah. two, three wears, warm everything up, sole starts flexing, and yeah. they're perfect. Was you who was saying had a, a military client who like, soaked his shoes yeah, in the boots in the bath or something? Soaked it in the bath, uh, put some plastic bags on it, and just they'll just mould to your foot. Mm. And that was because, because you couldn't cool. find, you're just trying to buy ready-to-wear yeah, boots, right? ready-to-wear boots they're that just wouldn't, fit. For mm. yeah, just wouldn't fit. Um, Felix, he has to be technically just as accurate as anybody, probably really? more so mm. when he's making pull-on boots, to stop yeah, them okay. slipping up and down in the heel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, technically, That's they like have a to be for the first time exactly like, like exactly. Hard, yeah. It's like everything is in the loafer. You've mm. got to work with the the actual pulling on the slip of the heel. So you yeah. have to be really precise oh. mm. making those types of boots, as well as um, you know, French calfskin in the West End. We can get away with endless mishaps and bits and pieces. <laughs> you know, and really. And important. getting the fit right is also part of the pleasure of shoemaking. Yeah, it it's just... one of the. It's it's problem solving. It's it's yeah. working things out, and that's part of the joy of what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wouldn't want to give that yeah. up. You know, I wouldn't want to just make. I mean, we have made the shoes on standard lasts. Uh, that we started off doing that, but actually, the bespoke side of it, part of the joy, is actually making them fit. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a key part of the interaction, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you can, you can email in a request for what you want in terms of sort of design, but it, I, I need to feel your fate. Yeah, yeah. You know, I need to sort of see, I need to give you a bit of a squeeze <laughs> yeah. while they're on to ascertain why it is that, that, you know, your fifth phalanges is hurting a little bit, and that's yeah. what I've seen. I think in the broader kind of, you know, expanded sort of bespoke world that we've kind of discussed quite a bit, there is perhaps a sliding rule of fit expectation. Okay. And so potentially from time to time, I will have a client who's never had a bespoke pair of shoes made, who I, in theory, I possibly could, um, not necessarily cut corners, but if I hadn't managed to realize the fit as accurately as I best would, yeah. I could maybe get away with, whereas if yeah. it was a West End client, they'd throw them back in my face. And also, you know, like I have, um, my business is split between sort of the UK and Japan and, I mean, Japanese, you just can't get away with shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's an exhausting, exhausting task trying to recognise something for, you know, probably one of the more particular craft-oriented cultures yeah. with really, really unusual feet by Western standards. Mm. So that in itself just throws mm. up a lot of problems. And, kind of and are they very knowledgeable about 
shoes and shoemaking, or, again, just, or just very demanding? I think it's the, the frightening thing about the Japanese clientele is their eye for detail mm. knows no bounds. And they will mm. see things that I just, and I'm just like, well, I mean, I'm flabbered. Yes, yeah. you're right. I, I yeah. will take this back and rectify this thing that I just didn't know was there. No, I'm, so right. sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's still, I mean, I, I, the people that come and see me in Tokyo are still the kind of people, um, relatively speaking, that might come and see me here. So they okay. aren't necessarily kind of classic bespoke clients. Is that easy with sneakers because they're coming to you for a particular look anyways yeah. so it's more kind yeah. of like yeah i just want and my main your design impact. is predominantly a lot of laces at the front yeah which offers you know so much versatility so do you make a bespoke fit. last or generally or you no i haven't done although i am currently working on a fully bespoke pair that had a last okay. fully measured up and made huh. um moment but um that's actually my first one but will that radically like, change the look of the final sneaker no or? not really okay. it's just more mm. to do with the instep and the soling is totally different sole that I would use okay. but it's using my upper so that's the kind of adaptation that I do of taking say my classic upper sort of style with the laces and the eyelets mm. and then a attaching that to a, a standard sort of work boot sole or you know put your hand in you can feel where your toes go and that yeah, only yeah. takes sort of a month and um, then the difference me and James Kern most of our clients would wear their shoes quite heavily like they're yeah. gonna go and take them out and like have a thrashing whereas <laughs> say a bespoke pair of shoes from you three yeah. will be a lot finer, a bit more classic and a bit more finished and polished. They'd well, be sat in gonna, a restaurant as opposed shoe, to going to a yeah, gig. Someone's going to put shoe yeah, trees yeah. in at the end of every day yeah. and yeah. really polish. look after, polish them, whereas <laughs> most of my shoes... No, 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 I like to get a shoe back that's all battered up. It means yeah. they've worn them, and it's just what, yeah. at the end of the it's day, that's what you want. Yeah. You want yeah. them to wear them and love them, and kind of. That's and as we point. always say, you never know if the shoe's working until it's come back for its first long sole and heel. Yeah. Until it's been worn for a, and lived in and loved for a bit. That's yeah. when you really know that you've done your job as a bespoke mm. shoemaker. So, look, when the repairs used to come in, the one thing that we wanted to see was how was the shoe being worn, yeah. what was actually happening on the inside. This, my, my one true regret in, in the field that I've chosen to work in is that I would love it to be more democratically priced, but the mm -hmm. truth yeah. is I tried to make it, yeah, at a, at a, what I saw as a more affordable price, and I just didn't do as good a job. It's a very, very labour, labour intensive process. Mm. We've only got a, a few minutes left. Maybe is there, are there any other ways that people see the industry changing? Like people wanting more priority on comfort, on sustainability of materials, on, I don't know, fit in orthopaedics or anything like that. Is that changing one of the kind of people's priorities? The insides are getting softer. I think people are so yeah. used to wearing trainers and shoes that they can yeah. get in the shop and walk out in and spend a day walking. So what in. is that actually physically in, in the inside? Is that a thinner like toe puff or whatever or what is it or less yeah. structured? What is well, what, how I you mean, soften it you up? Can, we use sort of foam inserts and, and okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like a memory foam yeah. kind of thing. Because, yeah. the, that's that's the and also that. on the top line we started putting in little foam oh, okay. yeah. fillets between the lining and the upper just to because people just aren't used to a really yeah. rigid shoe and classic yeah. West End shoes are really rigid when you and you have to break them in slowly yeah and they do soften they, they become amazingly comfortable and soft and, and lovely but it takes a while and people aren't used to it and that's why I've moved into recently is softening up say a classic derby but because of the properties of the, the, the collata that I'm using I haven't bothered lining it put a toe puff in put a heel counter in mm -hmm. the leather's about two to three millimeters thick it's got so much rigidity in it it holds its shape yeah mm -hmm. and then it it feels like a slipper instantly because there's nothing really sort of holding, keeping the foot in. So yeah. you're not going to be able to do that with most of what's mm. used for classic footwear. I was trained to make shoes that would last 30 years. Yeah. And obviously they're robust yeah. and strong and rigid because they have to be to last that long. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, what you're sacrificing is the longevity of the shoe. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we live in an age of throwaway culture. The idea yeah. that these shoes might last me five years is like, Look after them. You'll get double, triple yeah. that. You know, mm -hmm. just take every shoes and they'll last. And mm -hmm. that, in and of itself, is quite mind-boggling for a lot of clients. The Sorry. great thing about having clients who've been buying shoes for thirty years is mm. you go into their wardrobes and there's a history of bespoke making <laughs> there. You know, and you think, well, that's amazing. You know, these guys turn up wearing a pair of shoes they're twenty-five years old, yeah, or thirty years old. You know, and they're asking for another pair to be made, and they, you know, they may be of my generation. You know, what the shoes are going to see you out. You're going to be going before the shoes are. That's <laughs> no, I think it's quite nice to have. If like, obviously I make quite a strong, robust product 
that when I leave this world, I will still have a shoe or something there that I made. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite a nice thing to... Legacy. Yeah, legacy. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, I think we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody. That was a fantastic discussion. Yeah. That was really good. Thanks for all your points. Um, and, you know, I think we managed to kind of have everybody's kind of different views and styles kind of really kind of contribute to the conversation. So thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much. much.